Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. On this episode, investigative journalist Lawrence Roberts on his book, May Day 1971, when tens of thousands of anti-Vietnam War protesters, including veterans, came to Washington, D.C. in an effort to shut down the federal government. The protests and the Nixon administration's response led to the arrest of over 12,000 people, the largest mass arrest in U.S. history, and caused consequential changes to American law and politics. The 1971 Spring Peace Offensive filled a few days more than three weeks. It began with the arrival of a few anti-war veterans the weekend of April 17th. It began with no great expectations of success or impact, but it moved, sometimes in a furious rush of events. Incredibly, the Supreme Court became involved in the camping permits. The Capitol became a stage for guerrilla theater. Labor leaders and suburban mothers marched behind the leadership of hardcore anti-war activists. And the final stages brought confrontation and vandalism in the name of peace. Street sweep arrest of thousands of people in the name of order. Lawrence Roberts, that is a CBS News report. That's Max Robinson's voice, a journalist, a longtime journalist, now uh, passed away, uh, telling the story of May Day 1971, which you have captured in a recent book by the same name. In a nutshell, what is the story of May Day? Well, the book focuses on one season of dissent in Washington, D.C. in 1971. <clears throat> I argue that it is the most intense season of dissent in Washington's history, given how many protests there were and how long they were sustained. And they were all about, of course, uh, uh, the anti-war movement's effort to force President Richard Nixon to bring an end to the war in Vietnam, which had been raging for, for six years. Uh, and what happened in the spring of 71 was that uh, all of these different elements of the peace movement came to Washington in some sort of uh, uh, chaotic choreography, really, and held a bunch of different demonstrations. Uh, they started with uh, Vietnam veterans against the war. Uh, uh, there was a mass march uh, around the White House. And the last piece of it, the finale of this, uh, you know, several weeks of demonstrations was called May Day. And uh, it was put on by a group of, from a part of the new left called calling itself the May Day Tribe. And the idea was to bring thousands of people to the city to block, to blockade the streets and the bridges in order to, as they put it, create social chaos that would force uh, the administration to end the war uh, you know, finally end the war and bring all the troops home. And the, the protests ended up uh, being successful in a way, but what happened was the administration cracked down and, uh, and engaged the largest mass arrest uh, in American history. 12,000 people were rounded up over three days uh, and put into not only all the jail cells in Washington until they were stuffed and filled, but also uh, some makeshift detention camps. And uh, over years later, uh, the courts declared that all of the arrests, that the dragnet that the police had uh, engaged in throughout the city uh, was unconstitutional. And um, thousands of these detainees received uh, financial compensation for violations of their constitutional rights. Why do you think this 50-year-old story has resonance for us today? Well, because it's, uh, in a way, it's a story about one big protest, but I think it, the story it tells is a much larger one. Uh, it's a story about how we, as a nation, as a people, as individuals, dealt with one of those periodic emergencies in American democracy. You know, does the justice system deliver justice? Do people stick by their principles, or are they caught up in their own self-preservation or their fear to stand against the tide? Um, and it's a story between of the clash between an embattled president, in this case, Richard Nixon, who confronts a social movement in the streets, in this case, the anti-war movement, just as he's fighting to get reelected. What constitutional lines did he cross, did his administration cross uh, in an effort to stay in power? Um, and this temptation to bend the rules or break them 
that's a characteristic of, uh, of leadership that tends toward authoritarianism. You report in the book that May Day resulted in, quote, consequential changes to American law and politics, including the rule governing protests in D.C. Should people, no matter where they are in the political spectrum from conservative to progressive, find uh, this story important to them? Yes, I think so, because uh, among other things, what May Day did, particularly the legal cases that arose from these mass arrests, it affirmed the constitutional right of dissent. I mean, the courts spoke loudly and unanimously that Americans have the right to protest and dissent, and that even if they are causing inconvenience for the rest of us, you can't abandon civil liberties and just round people up who you don't like. And it's set case law, really, that's being cited today uh, against improper arrests, arrests and, and the right of assembly all over the, uh, all over the country. You have a personal connection to this story. What is it? I was around back in 1971. I was in Washington, and I was a 19-year-old college student, and uh, I was part of the May Day demonstration just as a participant, not in any way, shape, or form as a leader. Uh, and uh, when the police launched their dragnet, sweeping through the streets, arresting uh, not only people who were actually engaged in blockading streets, but anyone who looked like a demonstrator who had, you know, the dress of the time, the hippie dress of the time, the long hair, uh, as I did, uh, we were swept up as well and jailed. Did it change you the course of direction of your career or interests? Well, certainly, I think uh, the being involved in an event like that um, makes you much more interested in politics and uh, and the Constitution and law. So it, it definitely had something to do with my decision to become an investigative journalist. And I should say that, you know, after many years thinking back on this event, uh, you, know, you start to wonder what was behind all the different decisions that were made. What, were, what did people on all sides of the issue think? Because you only see these historical events from your own little point of view. And um, uh, I decided to try to investigate to find out uh, as much as I could to get a 360 degree view of uh, what had actually taken place. Americans have been living through a year full of protests from uh, Black Lives Matter, post George Floyd killing to uh, the recent events on, to the, in the Capitol uh, and demonstrations after the November election. There are some several touch points in the story you tell that are very similar to things that, that we have been experiencing now. Where do those similarities start and end, do you think? Well, um, I think living in this sort of political and social crisis that we're facing now, it, it can be hard to imagine if you weren't around back in the 60s and 70s just how intense the division was back then. Um, you know, things were very volatile uh, in, in, in this era, in the era of the 60s and 70s. And, uh, um, you know, in some ways, way more volatile and way more divisive than, than we were living through today. I mean, consider that we had political assassinations, we had racial assassinations, and for several years we had hundreds of people who were killed in these urban uprisings uh, that had their roots in racism, um, you know, mostly African-American shot by police. And of course we had a war, you know, a disastrous war that was also one of the most unpopular conflicts in, in U.S. history, all of this tearing the country apart. So in the sense that we were living through a period of in intense division where it seemed hopeless that we'd ever have unity, that feels very much like a parallel. But, you know, you do have uh, a different kind of, uh, you know, movement in the streets uh, today, most recently than you had back then. Then there was a mass movement uh, that was opposed to uh, one of the keystone American policies of the time, which was the war uh, in Vietnam. Uh, now, most recently at least, we're seeing this kind of resurgence of, um, you know, white, uh, you know, supremacy, white nationalism uh, in the streets, the attack on the Capitol that we saw on January 6th, uh, which is coming out of an entirely different sort of uh, motive. Well, let's dive into the story that you tell. As 1971 dawned, uh, give me a snapshot of the state of the war and the state of the body politic about the war. In 1971, uh, Richard Nixon had been in office for 
for two years. He, he ran in 1968 uh, against Hubert Humphrey, uh, the Democrat, um, on, on, on sort of a platform that had two parts, I think. One was to restore, restore law and order uh, because there were, had been those seasons of, uh, as I say, riots and uh, uprisings in the cities, anti-war demonstrations, students occupying college campuses. Um, that was one part of his vision. And the other uh, part of his campaign was to end the war, you know, basically end the war and the disorder that it was uh, causing in the country. Um, and he, he managed to win an extremely narrow victory over Humphrey. You know, the, the margin, if you go by popular vote, the margin uh, of victory that Nixon had over Humphrey was less uh, than what, uh, you know, the, uh, the 2016 election. So, you know, if you're trying to gauge the division in the country, that's a good, that's a good measure. So Nixon, instead of ending the war, he expanded it geographically. Um, in 1970, he had sent troops over the border of Vietnam into Cambodia, and that had engendered a huge national student uprising against the war, which ended in, with this tragic uh, shooting at, uh, at a university campus in Ohio, Kent State, where uh, National Guardsmen killed four uh, students. Um, and then in 1971, in the spring of 71, they, uh, Nixon decided to expand the war into Laos. And that sparked uh, another, um, an another big uprising in the anti-war movement, which led to the spring offensive. And at this point, uh, Nixon viewed this as a, ver a very serious political threat because uh, he was at this point at the lowest uh, approval rating of his first term. And in early 71, he, uh, you know, even, even wondered if he'd get his uh, party's nomination again for the 1972 election. So to him, the, um, the, the, the fact that hundreds of thousands of uh, anti-war demonstrators were descending on Washington, including, you know, veterans of the war themselves, uh, what, that was a political threat. And uh, he and his men were determined to sort of undermine these protests and not let them be seen as successful. Because if they were, it looked like it would uh, you know, undermine his chances of getting reelected. Your book is a timeline of the three months in the spring of 71, March, April, May, and it opens with one of those touch points that has resonance for our time. I'm going to turn to some archival video again. This is an ABC News report from March 1st, 1971. The single bomb set off by a timing device left the men's room a shambles, plumbing demolished, bricks and plaster ripped from walls. Army and FBI experts sifted the debris, seeking a clue to the nature of the explosive. There was heavy damage to the nearby barber shop. Windows were smashed there and 100 feet away in the Senate restaurant, where tables were overturned and a priceless stained glass mosaic destroyed. Damage estimated in the hundreds of thousands of dollars might have been far worse, but for the three-foot-thick walls in the oldest part of the Capitol. As it was, the violent explosion ripped off doors in nearby conference rooms. There was no damage to the Senate chamber itself on the floor above. Daylight revealed more smashed windows and debris. Tourists were barred from the Senate wing all day. But the entire Capitol will be reopened to the public as soon as possible. Lawrence Roberts, who bombed the Capitol? What was their aim? And how does it connect in with the May Day protests? Yes, very interesting. Uh, that that bombing was, in a way, the sort of kickoff to the spring offensive, although it was very controversial, of course, within uh, the new left, as it was called, and the anti-war movement. Uh, in, it, within the new left, there was a radical splinter group called the Weather Underground, which uh, the, the members of, uh, of, of the Weather Underground kind of uh, declared themselves to be kind of urban guerrillas, um, revolutionaries, and um, they went into these underground collectives and began setting up bombs at targets like courthouses, police stations, um, college buildings that were, uh, you know, linked to the military. Um, people who became so disillusioned with uh, democracy and capitalism, uh, believing that the only way to force change was to create some kind of revolutionary uprising by, you know, by starting with these bombings. And um, the Capitol, uh, you know, was, they said, was seen as sort of a symbol of U.S. domination uh, abroad and a symbol of the 
uh, you know, the people who were, uh, who were, uh, you know, working on the war. So, uh, they planted this bomb in a, uh, in, in a men's room <clears throat> underneath the Senate, uh, chamber. And, uh, it was, uh, intended to go off in the middle of the night when no one would be heard and no one was there. No one was hurt. They called in a, uh, warning to the switchboard, uh, after determining that people wouldn't be inside the, the Capitol. But within the movement and particularly within, um, uh, May Day, uh, this was, uh, a very controversial move because the purpose of May Day, the leaders who organized it believed, was to show that you could produce an act of mass nonviolence in, uh, you know, in America that would help to, you know, sort of move American policy. And the minute that you start connecting that to violence, whether it's a bombing or anything else, um, you're, you're, you've lost any chance to sort of move the middle of the country to persuade people to join your cause. And the leader of the, uh, one of the two main leaders of the May Day tribe was an activist named Lenny Davis, who was a longtime member of Students for a Democratic Society, which was the main campus-based new left uh, organization in the 60s. And Rennie Davis believed that, you know, all the parading and petitioning and uh, marching and carrying signs uh, over, the, over the previous six years had not done enough to, uh, you know, to change things and to bring the war to an end. And he believed, along with his colleagues, that the best way to uh, escalate tactics was to do this kind of mass nonviolent civil disobedience rather than just marching around. And uh, he felt that this bomb would, you know, undermine the message. And he tried, he knew about, uh, the, he had heard about the bomb because, showing again how all these connections work, his brother, John, was a member of the Weather Underground. And Rennie knew that this bombing was going to take place, although he says he didn't know where or exactly when it was going to happen. Uh, and he tried to talk the this splinter group, the Weather Underground, out of doing it, uh, but he failed. The bomb went on. And, um, you know, not only did it uh, feed the idea that, um, you know, the left, the anti-war movement was not strictly nonviolent, but it also triggered in the Nixon White House, uh, you know, more justification for, um, you know, trying to stop these mass demonstrations, which they argued was all part of the same um, general principle. Uh, you also write how it it turned the corner in security in Washington, D.C., which had been fairly lax until that point. How did the Capitol change forever as a result of that? Yeah. So, I mean, at the time of uh, the bombing, basically anybody could walk into the Capitol uh, and stroll through the halls without being without being checked. There were no metal metal detectors. I don't think there were even any video cameras. Uh, there was just barely, you know, some some guards at the doors, or you know, sort of a reception desk in a way. So the the people from the Weather Underground would go in, just melting into the crowds of tourists. Uh, they would, uh, you know, march around through the Capitol looking for a safe place to place their explosive device, and um, you know, and then leave. There was nobody to detect that, even though they were. At one point, they strapped, you know, sticks of dynamite uh, to their bodies, and, you know, and put a coat on them um, around it. And there was no way for anyone to detect that. So after the bombing, uh, there was, of course, a big, uh, you know, investigation into how it happened. And, uh, and then suddenly there started to be tighter security, metal detectors, um, you know, more checking of IDs and such um, at the, uh, you know, at the doors of the Capitol. And um, that was the sort of biggest step up in, in security there uh, until, you know, until 9-11. And uh, now, of course, here we are in another situation where uh, you had a mob break into the Capitol. And uh, again, all the security measures and the, uh, and, and the rules are under review. You mentioned Rennie Davis and described him. Uh, there's another character that was part of his planning group named David Dellinger. Who is he? So Rennie Davis and David Dellinger were both part of a group called the Chicago Seven. Some of your viewers might remember was they were the activists who were indicted by the Nixon administration for allegedly causing 
uh, the riots that were outside uh, in Chicago during the 1968 Democratic Convention. You know, the late, later investigation showed that the riots were really more of a police riot than, uh, than, than something that was triggered by the demonstrators. But because they were involved, but because both Rennie Davis and David Dellinger were involved in the planning for the, um, you know, some gatherings in Chicago during the convention, they were among those indicted um, by the Nixon administration. So during the Chicago 7 trial, Rennie and Dave really bonded. And they were a little bit of an odd couple. Rennie was uh, about 30 years old. He'd been in this SDS for uh, many years. He was a sort of traditional new left radical. David Dellinger was 55 years old. Um, he saw himself as sort of the older brother of the anti-war movement. He'd been involved in pacifism and, um, you know, a protest against the nuclear bomb and, you know, for, for, for decades. Uh, he devoted his whole life to the idea. But, but they, they bonded during the Chicago tr uh, trial, and uh, both of them came to the conclusion afterwards that, uh, you know, that the next stage of the, of the movement, if it were able to put an end to the war, had to be something more forceful um, than just the parading and the picketing that had been going on. And that's why they hatched this notion of a mass act of, of nonviolent civil disobedience. Dellinger was uh, an apostle of nonviolence. He absolutely believed that violence was counterproductive and morally wrong. Um, so that was very much the atmosphere in which they were planning this protest. Our producer, Nick Raval, found a bit of film of them in the Chicago Film Archive, and I just want to roll it so that uh, people can just get a sense of who these two planners of the May Day protests, what they looked and sounded like. They're coming to Chicago at the time of the Democratic National Convention, not to disrupt the convention, not to confront the police, National Guard troops, or men in the United States Army, but to challenge the policies of militarization that uh, uh, <clears throat> have, have been felt so strongly and brutally in Vietnam. And when the ruling party, a party administrating uh, militarism and racism, when it invites a convention uh, or it is invited into the city for a convention, it is inevitable that people who believe in decent human values and in, in human life and liberty will come with the convention in order to protest. Lawrence Roberts, if these two men and their uh, cohorts envisioned a mass protest coming to Washington, how did one organize such a thing in an era before the Internet when even so-called long-distance calls cost lots of money to make? How do they do it? It's fascinating. When you look back, you, it, it's hard to imagine that you could somehow plan a, a, a demonstration and expect thousands of people to show up, uh, and then they just do show up. Um, as you say, there was no internet. There were no there were no cell phones. Um, the basically you're 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 using analog uh, tactics like you know the mail, the U.S. mail, uh, back and forth, uh, occasional phone calls, and uh, the bulletin boards. The internet at the time were actual physical bulletin boards that uh, existed on college campuses and in sort of bookstores and coffee shops around the country. And that was where, you know, people found each other and, uh, and got information about this. So um, first there was this, you know, uh, effort to disseminate the idea. And then uh, uh, Rennie and uh, Rennie Davis and David Dellinger, along with some others like John Fines, who also was a Chicago 7 um, uh, defendant, uh, started making the rounds of college campuses. They went to dozens and dozens um, in the fall, beginning in the fall of 1970 and all the way up until the spring of 71, making speeches, talking to people, trying to explain the plan um, and get people excited about what was happening. But all the time you're doing this, you really don't know if it's going to be successful. You don't know how many people are going to show up. And until, you know, the weeks before May Day, um, you know, Dellinger and others were wondering, you know, what kind of a turnout they would get because you didn't have the ability to you know, have people sign up online or anything like that. So if the planning was pretty much out in the open, how was the federal government, particularly the FBI, involved in following the, the planning stages? You know, J. Edgar Hoover was uh, the director of the FBI at the time, and he was very, you know, after the 
after the sort of communist party issues of the 1950s, the new left was uh, a huge target of the FBI. And they spent uh, a lot of time uh, placing undercover agents with all these different anti-war groups at all of the, they, they had agents who were just following Lenny Davis and David Dellinger around and would go to uh, these meetings on the college campuses and report back to the FBI offices what they said. Um, they managed to recruit informants uh, in, in the movement. Um, there was very little that went on inside uh, the anti-war movement that um, the FBI and the White House did not know about. And I, in the course of researching my book, I found, uh, you know, many of the, um, you know, intelligence reports that were almost weekly coming to the White House and to other agencies explaining in great detail what happened at every meeting, what, who said what, you know, what the danger was, what the issues were. Um, so they, they had full knowledge of this. And, and in addition to that, um, one of the ways that um, the May Day protest was organized was that the organizers put together a very detailed 24-page uh, tactical manual, which showed all of the, I believe there were 23 original points where people were supposed to go to blockade the city. So it would, it would give a detailed map of the bridge, of the traffic circle, of the intersection, explain the best way to block it off. Um, there were pictures. Um, so, and, and this was not secret. This was handed out and it was published in underground newspapers and you know I found copies in the files of all of the you know White House people who were following the, the matter um, so there wasn't anything unknown about what was going to happen um, uh, and and the main sort of disconnect was in my view because even though they were even though the undercover agents and and, and, and informants were inside the movement and could see that this was planned as a nonviolent protest, uh, either the government folks either didn't believe that it was going to be nonviolent or didn't want it to be nonviolent, but kind of produced this huge kind of overreaction, which we saw resulting in the, in the May Day mass arrest, um, arguing that this was not a nonviolent um, uh, event at all. We, um, in, in the recent uh, security issues in the Capitol, we heard the city of Washington officials talk regularly about the importance of preserving D.C. as a First Amendment space. But in 1971, what was the attitude about it, and what were the laws about gathering in Washington? Uh, right. The law, you know, the, the, the National Mall um, had become a, uh, uh, you know, a center of uh, of of dissent, a place where people, you know, petitioning for redress of grievances, as the Constitution says, uh, would gather. Uh, it, beca it became kind of the, the First Amendment, in a way, just embodied uh, on the Mall. And um, for the most part, um, uh, these protests, on, these demonstrations, I shouldn't say protests, because not all of them were, these demonstrations on the Mall, uh, you, know, you had to apply for a permit from the National Park Service. Um, most of the time, groups were given that permit. Um, you, you know, in, in, in 1971, the May Day folks asked for a permit to camp on uh, uh, an area called West Potomac Park, which is sort of uh, between the Lincoln and the Thomas Jefferson Memorials. Um, and the Park Service granted the permit. Um, and uh, in the weekend before the before the um, uh, workday protest that was supposed to begin uh, the, the blockade, uh, forty or fifty thousand people showed up at this campground and uh, camped out with tents and lean tos um, in order to prepare for this uh, this traffic blockade on the uh, on rush hour the next day, um, and that was all legitimate under the under the government permit that they they obtained um it also included that west potomac park camp out also included this was Randy davis's idea uh an all-day all-night rock concert which began on saturday afternoon and was supposed to go all the way through sunday afternoon as a way to both gather 
uh, as many people as possible for the protest and entertain the folks who had come from all over the country. And people came, 50,000 people came from every state all over the country. So the, the, the sort of campus recruitment that Rainey Davis and David Dellinger had um, employed over the past, the previous several months uh, was quite successful. And as the park filled up, um, that became more and more of a threat as perceived by um, the government and the local police. You um, mentioned at the outset that that there were a series of protests leading up to May Day, uh, each with more volume, that continued to raise the temperature here in Washington. An important one among those is the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Uh, how Was there coordination between the veterans group and the May Day planners, or was this an organic thing? There was coordination in the sense of the scheduling. So all of the all of the uh, groups were aware of what the other groups were doing. Some, there was a lot of overlap between organizations. Some people who were members of one were also, you know, members of others. It wasn't that formal. Um, but the general awareness was, okay, uh, you know, the, the Vietnam War is not ending. We've just expanded it again into, geographically into Laos. It's time for everybody to come uh, in this springtime. And they each knew when the others were coming. The Vietnam vets uh, wanted to be, uh, you know, those those members of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War who were not sympathetic to May Day, and there were some who were not sympathetic to the May Day plan because they saw it as potentially too confrontational. Um, they wanted to be the first ones in town. So in the middle of April, um, that was what happened. The Vietnam vets showed up, um, about a thousand of them. And then uh, uh, over the next week, there was a much bigger mass march, a sort of traditional mass march. It probably was the largest mass march held in Washington to that point, uh, 400,000 plus people. And that was done under a much a sort of an umbrella coalition, a much bigger coalition than the May Day folks. Um, it included people from May Day and included people from the Vietnam vets, but it was uh, you know, sort of one gigantic um, march that had people from groups, including unions and church groups and longshoremen and uh, radicals and moderates and Democrats, Democratic members of Congress. Uh, it was, a you know, it's supposed to be a huge display of how much anti-war sentiment had taken hold in the country. Most of the country by this point, I should say, was against the war, wanted the war to end, um, uh, despite what uh, the Nixon administration was doing. Uh, and so that protest was held on a Saturday. And then when those people went home, the folks who stayed behind were the more militants, and they were the one le- led up over the next week uh, to the May Day protest. But everybody was coordinated in terms of knowing who was doing what when. So as the, the pressure continues to mount, the crowd size continues to mount, what was happening on the security side and the political side. When were the decisions made enough is enough uh, with these protests and moving in to uh, begin arrests? Well, uh, the, during, the, during the spring, um, the Nixon folks, Nixon aides and the Justice Department and others were getting more and more concerned about the political impact of the demonstrations because they were extremely successful. The uh, Vietnam vets coming to town was a new thing, you know, soldiers who were coming from a war that was still going on, coming to the city to uh, express their opposition to that war, returning their combat medals to Congress. Um, That was shocking to a lot of Americans who may not have been paying as close attention to the anti-war movement. Um, That was politically very uh, dangerous to um, to the Nixon folks. So that happened. Then you had this mass march, which was so big, um, and that also happened. So uh, by the time all that was going, and the Nixon people were following the public opinion polls, of course, which showed that uh, a larger number of people were approving of the anti-war movement, a larger number of people were opposed to the war. Um, upcoming now is the most intense you know, finale of these uh, protests, the May Day uh, blockade. And so Nixon, uh, Nixon's people 
uh, started to convene these war councils, I call them, at the Justice Department to figure out what to do to, you know, to essentially undermine any further success of this uh, protest. You know, if the, from their point of view, if everything that happened before was viewed favorably and then the city was shut down in a nonviolent way by the May Day tribe, that would make the whole spring offensive, as they call this you know, string of protests, that would make the whole spring offensive um, look like a huge success for the movement and would put huge political pressure on, on Nixon to do something about ending the war sooner. So they convened these, uh, these war councils. There are about a dozen people in these war councils from the Justice Department, from the Pentagon, from the White House, from the local police, uh, in order to figure out what to do. And um, watching the, watching the uh, crowd grow at um, West Potomac Park to 40 or 50,000 people, way more than they thought would show up. Their informants had told them that maybe 5,000 people would show, but 10 times as many showed up. So this, this blockade was looking dangerous from their point of view. What could they do to stop it from success? So they came up with this idea, they hatched this idea at, the, at these war councils, really two ideas. One was uh, you know, to bring in uh, the active duty military. And until this past month, when we saw uh, you know, National Guard, tens of thousands of National Guards people brought to Washington to protect during the uh, inauguration of, of Joe Biden, um, up until that point, the largest number of uh, military brought to, active duty military brought to D.C. Um, had been May Day. Nixon wanted uh, the military positioned uh, in case anything happened during May Day as a way to kind of tamp down uh, the protests. So 10,000 active duty military were called in to D.C. in addition to the riot squads of the police, in addition to the National Guards, uh, guardsmen who were here, here as well. So that was one thing. And the other idea that was hatched at the meeting um, was to revoke the, the permit, the camping permit that the government had, you know, legally given to the May Day tribe and revoke it in such a way that they could break up the camp. So secretly withdraw the permit and then send in the riot squad at dawn, you know, 6 a.m. On, on Sunday, uh, the day before the blockade was supposed to happen, uh, to, um, you know, to clear the park, tell everybody that, sorry, your permit's revoked. Uh, it was revoked secretly and you all have to leave. And that would, they hope, they hoped would break up uh, the protests so that on Monday morning, no one would show up. And that's what they did. They revoked the permit, sent in the riot squad. And while the music was still going on, because it was supposed to be an all night concert, suddenly their helicopters, you know, hundreds of, uh, you know, riot police with batons and helmets and visors sweeping through this, you know, peaceful campground. So in that instance, it was D.C. police or were they active duty military that were making the arrests and sweeping the campground? The active duty military were not used directly in the arrests. They guarded the people who were detained uh, over the three days. Uh, they guarded the makeshift detention camps. Um, they were there to intimidate. They lined the bridges with, you know, fixed bayonets uh, to prevent the, uh, the blockade. But they themselves, the military themselves, were not used in carrying out the arrest. That was a, that was a police action uh, directed by uh, the Nixon administration. We have, uh, as, as everyone knows, watching this, President Nixon recorded his Oval Office conversations. We have one of those. This is from April as the protests are underway, talking with Chuck uh, Colson, his aide, about the protest. Let's listen just to get a sense of his mindset. Have you found out uh, who these veterans are that are coming in? Yes, yes, sir. We had some reports today that uh, uh, there's a, uh, well, I had two reports from two people who were infiltrated. Uh, one is that there are three to four hundred veterans, and the, the balance, which is maybe six or seven hundred, are non-veterans, and the uh, kids who have brought uh, fatigue uniforms, military uh, jackets. I've had another. Could you find one that had? And get will any will will any press man play the fact that one guy bought a fatigue uniform to look like a veteran? We arranged, uh, Mr. President. God, that would be great if just one, just one did. Well, we arranged today for AP 
uh, an AP reporter to go in and we identified some people for him to talk to. We also did the same thing with a Baltimore Sun reporter. Right. And uh, hopefully, if these fellows are honest, they'll uh, they'll start picking some of this up. We've also got a couple of kids on the inside who are going to uh, go up to the cameras and say, you know, this is a phony deal and I'm leaving here. What's your reaction when you hear that managing the news story? And fascinating because what happened was they did arrange for an AP reporter, an Associated Press reporter, to go into, this is the um, Vietnam Veterans Against the War camp, not the May Day camp. But uh, they did arrange for an AP reporter to go in on the theory, you know, Nixon was was pushing this idea that the veterans who came to town were not really Vietnam veterans. They were posing, you know, as veterans. So the AP reporter went in and collected, uh, you know, uh, the discharge papers, uh, which these guys carried with them, um, from all of the uh, veterans there, more than more than a thousand, and 99.9 percent of them were veterans, uh, were people who had served in Vietnam. So the story was the op- the story that came out was the opposite of uh, what Nixon and Chuck Colson, his aide, uh, his aide that was in charge of dirty tricks, by the way. Um, uh, uh, wanted. So it was kind of a, a flop for them from that point of view. And in fact, that was one of the things that <laughs> it backfired in that it turned the, you know, the press and the public more in favor of what the veterans were doing, because not only did Nixon and his folks, uh, you know, try to, you know, pass around fake news that they weren't really Vietnam vets, um, but they also tried to evict the veterans from their campground a different campground on the National Mall. The vets camped uh, very close to the U.S. Capitol uh, because their plan was to go to the Capitol and return their combat medals onto the steps uh, in protest and bitterness about the war. And um, uh, the Nixon administration went to, the, went to the Supreme Court to get them kicked out of the camp, um, you know, and the, because they did not have a permit. They just went there on their own saying that, you know, as veterans, we think we have a right to a piece of property in uh, D.C. after what we've gone through in the war. Uh, so uh, the, the government tried to kick them off the um, off that property. And, it, and, it, and that also backfired because it became this, uh, you know, public cause. You know, how can you take these ex-warriors and, you know, haul them off to jail uh, just because they're trying to exercise their constitutional rights in the country that sent them off to war? And... Um, Uh, In the end, the administration backed off, even though they won the court in court, the right to remove them from their camp, uh, they let them stay. And the next day, the the veterans, Vietnam veterans, marched uh, in single file to the U.S. Capitol and they hurled their silver stars and all their other combat medals and their ribbons onto the Capitol steps in protest, which really became... Uh, one of the most dramatic uh, and emotional parts of the entire spring offensive. And we should, just for the record, remind people that this is where John Kerry got his start in uh, public life uh, as part of that protest. We have about 15 minutes left, and I want to get to the real heart of this story, which is the series of protests on May 2, 3, 4 in the city with the intent of shutting the city down. And uh, you're telling us that thousands of people, many 40, 50,000 people, had assembled for this. Ultimately, what are the estimates on how many people took part and what happened to them? Uh, it's believed that you know, somewhere between 12 and 15,000 people uh, showed up on uh, Monday morning, May 3rd, 1971, uh, to block the s- streets and the bridges and the uh, traffic circles <coughs> in D.C., um, and this was a surprise to the uh, to the police and to the Nixon administration because after having broken up their um, their campground, uh, they believed that most of the kids and then most of them were young uh, went home. Uh, you know, would leave the city or not bother to participate, and many did. But uh, as I say, twelve to fifteen thousand showed up that day, and the police were quickly overwhelmed. You know, they. Uh, one of the things that the May Day tribe uh, uh, put in place was kind of an innovative civil disobedience tactic of instead of just sitting in the street and waiting for people to come and arrest you, you know, block the traffic. And then when the police show up, 
you know, disappear and go try to find another intersection. They call it kind of a hit and run, um, a hit and run kind of civil disobedience, that, which they call mobile tactics. <clears throat> and um, so the police were overwhelmed. And un- under the rules, the police were supposed to, uh, when arresting anybody, uh, in the act of committing a crime, which was trespassing or disorderly conduct, or whatever the charge would be in this case, uh, they were supposed to, on the spot, fill out um, uh, an arrest form uh, called a field arrest form. Uh, you know, who who was the arresting officer? What was the offense? The name of the defendant, so that they would have the paperwork to support the charge once these people were brought into court. But there were so many people that in order to, if they did that, uh, you know, in each case, uh, the police realized the blockade would succeed because there weren't, there wasn't, there weren't enough officers to take down everybody who was doing this. So uh, they made a decision. The decision was made by the Washington's police chief, whose name was Jerry Wilson. Uh, And at the time, by the way, DC didn't have home rule, which means that Uh, it couldn't elect its own mayor or city council. So uh, the police chief was in essence appointed by and answered to the White House. So when ordered to make mass arrests as they were, uh, the police chief, you know, had the choice of either doing his job or not. So the police chief decided to abandon these uh, procedures uh, of arrest and just start arresting everybody uh, who was out in the streets. And then in a in a uh, uh, sort of subsequent wave, um, the riot police decided to, on somebody's orders, just sweep through the city uh, and arrest anybody who looked like they might be a demonstrator, even if they weren't blocking a street, even if they weren't near any intersections uh, that were being blocked. Uh, and in doing so, the first day, Monday, May 3rd, 7,000 people were arrested. It, it, that remains the largest mass arrest in American history. And, you know, very quickly, every cell in the city was filled to overflowing. Uh, A cell that was meant to hold two people had 12 people. Um, The jail yards were filled, and they had to look around for another place to put these thousands of people. Uh, And what they settled on was a a football practice field near RFK Stadium, uh, in which they put another several thousand people and it was just a field surrounded by a chain link fence and the fence was guarded around the clock by uh, some of these act- active duty military who, who Nixon had brought in into the city. And then at night when the temperatures got cold, because it was actually pretty cool for May in Washington, it was down to the 40s, uh, they bust all those people and others inside the Washington Coliseum, uh, which uh, was used for, you know, which normally was used for hockey games or the circus or something like that. And um, that's where people stayed for for days, uh, most without any access to the outside, uh, without any access to lawyers, <clears throat> um, just, uh, you know, just under detention um, after this mass uh, arrest. Ultimately, uh, with lack of due process and unsanitary conditions and lack of even knowing what the charges were against them with these thousands of people jailed, your story is one of the system working because the courts responded and public defenders got involved. Uh, So ultimately, um, how did this situation, how did it come before the courts and how did the courts rule and why? Well, uh, there were 7,000 people arrested that first day um, in the in the dragnet. The next day, 2,000 more people were arrested <clears throat> uh, during a sit-in in front of the Justice Department, again, without due process. And then on the third day, an echo of uh, a little bit of what we're seeing now, uh, 1,200 people were arrested because they were on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Now, they didn't try to break into the Capitol. It was entirely peaceful demonstration, just sitting on the steps or standing on the steps. Um, uh, But um, then they were invited there by members of Congress who were giving speeches to them when the police decided to basically go up the steps and bring everybody into custody there. So another 1,200 or so people were arrested. So um, the courts, uh, so at the time, 
uh, DC had a, a public defender service, which was run by a woman named Barbara Bowman. It was the largest public defender service in the country. And um, with all these people in, in, in court, they didn't have any representation. And Barbara Bowman decided to uh, bring her lawyers uh, in to uh, you know, try to heal this uh, egregious uh, you know, uh, uh, problem with justice. So she, uh, they brought a habeas corpus lawsuits into the courts. And um, after several days uh, of fighting with the government lawyers, um, they managed to free all the prisoners um, who were locked up. And almost all of them were uh, freed without even a, you know, a formal charge put against them because there was no paperwork. And many of them were committing absolutely no crimes when they were swept up. Um, but just that was not enough. Then uh, civil liberties lawyers stepped in, including the ACLU, and filed lawsuits on behalf of the people who had been detained uh, for violations of their First Amendment and their Fourth Amendment rights. And um, over the years, these cases were unanimously decided in favor of the defendants. So not only were they ultimately freed, but the courts ruled that the government had to pay them millions of dollars in damages uh, for violation of these rights. <clears throat> and uh, people received checks for as much as $3,000, you know, 10 years later when the cases were finally settled um, as compensation for what happened to them on May Day. But it took another uh, decade or more before those who did have arrest records were expunged. Why did it take so long? Uh, it was battle in the courts um, about how about whether these records uh, should be um, wiped from, uh, you know, wiped from the records, uh, wiped from the courts. Um, government lawyers kept uh, saying that it was unnecessary. Um, and uh, the ACLU and others, uh, you know, argue that this was a case in which, um, you know, people had completely, uh, you know, uh, arrest records that were completely unjustified. So that set a standard for, uh, as I say, for the uh, many future cases and when arrest records can be expunged. <clears throat> and then um, the question became how to do it, how to uh, you know, get rid of these records, which were being kept in various you know, storage boxes, first on the police side, then turned over to the, uh, to the lawyers who were you know, uh, bringing these cases. So it wasn't until 1987 that the final decision was made to take all these records, all these boxes, haul them over to the big incinerator on the Anacostia River and burn them. And that's what happened. So in our last five minutes, about the, I wanted to focus on the major lessons from May Day 1971. You write in the, a section on the aftermath that the, even though the war continued, the protesters won and the administration lost. Uh, because of the courts standing behind them. And uh, you told the Washington Post in an interview, the authority of the justice system, the ability to self-correct, was really striking and heartening and felt inspiring. So I was hoping the book would provide a lesson in that. Can you build on that a bit? Sure. Well, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, is the legacy of May Day is that it affirmed the constitutional right of dissent. You know, the courts spoke loudly and unanimously that, Americans have this right, and you can't abandon civil liberties to, you know, jail people that you don't like. Um, that's important. Um, the other thing I think is that it shows that uh, in the moment of a national crisis, um, it's difficult for people close to the heart of power uh, to resist the drift toward authoritarian thinking, right, to convince themselves that, uh, you know, doing the wrong thing or bending the rules is, is good for the people or good for the country rather than what's really going on, which is self-preservation, this idea of holding on to power. And uh, I think we see that, that same cycle coming back sometimes in American history. And, um, you know, it also shows that it's harder that it, than it might appear to crack the institutions of American democracy. Because, you know, Nixon and his men this was all secretly done at the time. Uh, you know, the book uncovered this, but uh, they were turning this season of dissent into sort of a laboratory for schemes that they would 
soon direct against their political enemies in the 1972 campaign. Um, you know, dirty tricks, uh, infiltrating, uh, you know, organizations, wiretapping and bugging. Um, you know, at the time, this was widely suspected as happening during May Day, but it, but it was never proven. So in a sense, you know, May Day was the first cover-up by the Nixon administration. They orchestrated what amounted to an extra constitutional strategy to undermine the protests. They played dirty tricks. And, and this, to my mind, is when they learned how to ignore the rule of law with impunity. And as the book shows, Nixon's May Day mindset led directly to his orders weeks after the protests to undermine the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg. Nixon put one of his trusted aides in charge of that operation. And, uh, you know, they ended up breaking into the office of Dan Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Uh, and then some of the same operatives broke later into the Watergate. And we know how that turned out. But, you know, in all of these cases, ultimately, uh, the justice system prevailed and uh, American democracy survived. And I think that gives us hope for the future. So related to that, um, Judge Harold Green, federal judge, who, who was one of the key uh, federal jurists ruling in the May Day uh, protesters' uh, grievances, uh, you chose a quote from him in the front piece of your book. And the quote is, whenever American institutions have provided hysterical response to an emergency situation, we have come later to regret it. Why did that quote resonate with you so much? Well, I think, uh, I think that Green was speaking from experience in a number of cases. Um, uh, in, in he, he was talking not only about what happened during May Day, but what happened during the, um, during the uh, riots after Martin Luther King's assassination uh, in 1968, when uh, there was an overreaction <clears throat> by... Um, you know, by police in many cities. And uh, uh, I think his sense was that um, we, we tend to get hysterical about um, uh, the, the, the strength of the country's democracy to survive um, these challenges. And that if we stick to our principles, uh, our beliefs, our values as professed by the constitution, uh, then we tend to come out of it all right. The book is May Day 1971. Investigative journalist Lawrence Roberts is the author. Thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you, Susan. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.